right, so we've got Steven Stamp, Stamp Lax with us. How is everything uh, up there today? I mean, there was a lot of exciting lacrosse over the weekend. It was a lot to take in, some close games, and I think an upset with uh, New York, San Diego, but... I mean, New York's been playing well right here, and I'm going to give you credit again because you're the first guy that I heard say, hey, I think New York makes the playoffs. And I was still on the fence. I was like, they're playing better. They're doing some good things, but they, you know, they've got some distance to go. But uh, no, they've been, they've been dynamite. And I mean, Cameron Dunkerley, I, I think it's funny. People have been getting on the Dunkerley train and I really like Cam. I think he's a great kid. I think he's a promising young goalie. I haven't conv been convinced he's ready yet to be the starter for a, uh, for a playoff slash championship contending team. He was fantastic though against San Diego, especially in the second half. A lot of his one goal and, Made some really good saves. And, and to me, the big thing is he's looking so consistent the last couple of games in, in terms of his comfort, his positioning, and just being, you know, making the saves look easy and not having to make all the spectacular saves. And I think that's a big difference. Yeah, that is huge because, uh, you know, you, you you need like three or four of them saves a night. But if you're relying on your goalie for more than that, then, you, you know, that's on your defense. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to take a look at some highlights, some of the uncommon highlights that you see from around the league. And we're going to start in Halifax, where Trevor Smith, who was a terrific junior player, and uh, when he was drafted – come into the league he was uh, I believe a first rounder late in the first round by Halifax and didn't get a lot of attention because he's a real D first guy we are going to see the difference a defender can make here in this game for Halifax against Las Vegas where Halifax really controlled the game um, but they didn't wind up winning by more than two goals so they wound up being a two goal game and you can see plays like this making a difference the first one we're going to take a look at is actually in the first quarter and Las Vegas isolates Rob Hellier Hellier tries to make a pass across to somebody who's cutting in, and Smith just knocks it down, leads to a break the other way. That was pretty nice. And then these two are gorgeous. And this is going to be two different plays back-to-back -back, where Smith, on the power play, he's the guy with the uh, Thanos-looking gloves down at the bottom left uh, as we look at it, the, the heavy orange ones. Look at that pickoff with the pass across the crease. This is beautiful. You're going to see it again, the nice slow-mo. What reaction gets out there, full extension to take this pass away from Sean Wesley, who had a hat trick in the game, was very dangerous. And that's, again, that's not a replay. That is a separate play, making him pick off in the same spot of the crease. And just a fantastic play by a, few, a trio of plays by Trevor Smith. And those can be game changers, especially those shorthanded steals across the crease to, to Wesley, who was very dangerous. Like, yeah, he really came on towards the uh, the end of the game. He had a great game. He's a, I mean, he's a good player. He's been he's been good. He seems to be really coming into his own. It's interesting seeing those gloves. I've, I've thought about them fairly often in Halifax. There's three or four guys on the team that wear the different, the, those ones that are predominantly orange. When you get a close-up, you see you know some of the detail, but they really do just look, they remind me of the old um, Cooper lacrosse gloves that were just kind of a pale and more of a, a yellowy but similar kind of they just look huge and you've got trevor smith uh, clark peterson and dawson thieves all wear those and maybe maybe one other thunderbird i don't know if that's just they prefer for some reason those ones to the gloves that most of the thunderbirds are wearing but uh, i always find it interesting to see them because they just on the screen they look so big they make their hands look really huge. Next highlight we're going to go to, or a series of highlights, and this is a little more common. You're going to see this on the highlight reels. Five goals by Ryan Sheridan, the rookie who had sat a couple of games. Just some great insight um, coming I'm going to share from the uh, the team and from Sheridan on, um, on my Stampers Musings this week on IL Indoor. Um, about how he sat out two games because he just wasn't playing particularly well and really benefited and came back and did what we we're about to watch here. Five goals. The first three come in in back to back to back order. There's the first one, just a shot from the outside, a nice little screen there from his teammate, and he fires it over the top. And you're going to see as Brett Craig tries to get to him, Robert Hope's coming out. They just do a good job in the two man game. And then it's mostly Sheridan from this point on. Look at this. He's got it. There's uh, hope out on him. He's fighting through, fights through, goes to the crease. Nobody can get there in time, except Craig does get there. I think it is at the end for a hit, or maybe it's Jordan Gillis. Um, yeah, it'd be Gillis. And he, but look at this. Hope's a big, strong defender. Here comes Gillis, and Sheridan still fights through and gets that shot off and bounds it, bounces it home. He is a beast, so athletic, so skilled. And when he is playing like that, getting underneath, getting to the net, it's amazing. And 
the next one is going to come pretty quickly. So let's just zip through. I love this part. I don't know if you were planning to cut this, Greg, but I love this fast forward to the next goal because this shows you how soon after the next goal came. Here we go. We're going to slow down. Sheridan's going to get the ball. Jonathan Donville is backing up, gives it to Sheridan. Drops it for a moment. Here he goes. Boom. Spin underneath. Goes horizontal as he's being tossed to the ground. Just fantastic stuff with one hand on the stick. The right hand reaches out. And the one little edge is if you're a right-hander and you do shoot right-handed, is you've got the hand a little further up the shaft. Because you see, you know, left-handed guys, when or guys who shoot left but are right-handed, you have to hold it at the bottom of the, the shaft, which I think having it up a little bit makes a benefit. Now, here comes the fourth one. This is in the fourth quarter. Sheridan, he only scores going right to left. No, just kidding. He's obviously can score anyway. But he does get all five of the goals on the same night. Here he goes. This is him. Woo! Nice little duck with the woo 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 Zip by, and in he goes. Great little move. Comes in. Perfect placement. And then he gets the next goal of the game again. He's scoring consecutive goals. Now this, sorry, one more look at the first one. I love that angle from behind. You can really see the placement. And then we're going to see one more play. And in this case, Sheridan just takes the ball from Callum Crawford, gets a little pick, drives to the net, and pulls up instead of going because he sees that the way is blocked by a couple of defenders. And uh, they don't really get out on him. And I just think it's an amazing stuff from ryan sheridan um really well played now this is a bonus and this is showing that ryan sheridan has been doing amazing things for a while he was as a junior player got called up to the senior nanaimo timberman for a playoff game and, and this play is what he did the one hand behind the back bouncer scores that's a junior player in a senior playoff game it is unbelievable. The skill has always been there. He just has needed to figure some things out in terms of the cross IQ and, you know, sense of when to when to do things, when not to. Obviously, that was working very well on the weekend. You know, you wonder the motivation sitting a couple games kind of. It's weird. Some guys come back from that. They handle it great. Other guys, you know, uh, if you're a cold shooter, you'll say, keep giving them the ball. Eventually, they'll go, ah. And then other guys, it seems you do something like that. And then, boom, next thing you know, he comes out. That was crazy. So, he had what, yeah. three goals on the season beforehand and then five goals last night. Yeah, it's crazy. So, what I want to do, and we don't do this very often, but I want to run through those five highlights once again, the goals. Uh, the last four in particular. And they can be compressed. I'll let you uh, deal with the, the tech side like you always do, Greg. You're great at that. But compress them. And a few years ago, I had Pat Coyle, the head coach of Mam Colorado Mammoth, on Lax Beat, uh, my, my podcast with Fox Beat at the time. And I talked to him. He's a Hall of Fame defender, one of the great tough defenders of all time in the NLL. And I asked him, as a, as a Hall of Fame defender and now as a head coach in the league, what do you see different about the, differently about the way guys play? from when you were in the league to now. And we talked about a few things, but the one thing that he stressed was that it drives him nuts that guys don't cross-check. They get out there with one hand, waving the stick around, trying to hook guys and stuff. And watch these highlights. I don't think I have to say a whole lot after that, after what Pat Coyle told me. It may not be a very fun film review session for the Colorado defense with Pat Coyle this week. No, and actually Halifax, that was a big part of uh, a couple of the goals that were scored on them was just guys not cross-checking guys or pushing guys out of the crease, just kind of swatting at the stick, swatting at the ball, trying to move it around. And uh, yeah. I believe it was once on Withers and once on Tyson Bell because I did. I remember clipping that today and thinking, oh, man, yeah, yeah Chrysler is not going to be happy with that performance right there. Yeah, no, it's it's and it's it's such a simple skill. It's so easy to get away from it, but – it's again, you got to get back to the fundamentals and just make those cross checks because, you know, Panther City with that with that game, I, I think Colorado is probably going to look back at that and say, holy cow, what an opportunity that we squandered there. All right. We're going to take a look at another little play or sequence of plays from the Colorado at Panther City game. And this is a fun one because it's what I call the uh, double two for one or the two for one, two for one or the whatever you want to call it, it is a two-for-one shot sequence that goes both ways. And you don't see that very often. We're going to see a save by Nick Dick, Nick Gaymood, the outlet pass, and here comes Liam Patton. Now, just if you watch Patton as he steps over center, he is looking for someone on the bench. He gets the pass just before center, steps across, and looks to the bench. He's going to pass it. Obviously, somebody yells two-for-one, which if you're, if you're fairly new to lacrosse, don't understand this, this play. What happens? Between about 52 and about 40 seconds, teams will take a shot 
from long range, just fired it. If it goes in, fantastic. You love the goal. Generally, you're just trying to get a shot, give the ball to the other team, force them to come down and make a play, use their 30, and you and, and give you time afterwards when you get possession back to set up a play. You can call timeout, you pull your goalie, set up, go with the six on five. So Liam Patton gets the call, go for the two for one. There's nobody else around, no rebounders, nothing. He just goes in, lets it rip right from the straining lanes, right foot's actually behind it. Pops out to one of the Colorado defenders. They throw it ahead. Here's Joey Capito. Joey Capito is arriving near the restraining line, and there's about 44 seconds still left on the clock. So he's going to take a two-for-one. And this one, if you're thinking in terms of shot selection, would look even more egregious. There's four Panther City defenders out there. Nobody else in Colorado, even in the frame, he rips one on Nick Day mood. And the funny thing is, this all happens so quickly that Panther City winds up going forward and getting the ball, moving it ahead and getting a timeout with 34 seconds left or so. But there's about a 10 second difference with the shot clock. So it didn't actually work out for either team, which I think is pretty fun. And if you were watching the game or if you hear the beginning of of the commentators chatting at the end of this clip and you hear them say, oh, some, uh, I forget what it is they said, some bit of a shooting gallery. And then they talk about how uh, the coaches may be telling the guys, you know, be more patient, fix your shots better. That's not these guys picking to shoot early because they think it's a good idea or on their own advice. That's guys being told, hey, we're going for the two for one. Take this shot. Let's uh, let's get the last possession. Yeah, no, they're, they're being told. But like you said, taking it without anybody down there to get the rebound. If you, I don't know, you will see guys do it sometimes, but you seem to have to be a lot closer to the net to get that one that you're sure you can kind of kick off into the corner and give you a fighting chance. Whereas like, well, you're not trying to get a rebound there though, right? You're trying to turn the ball over to the other team because like if there's 45, 50 seconds left, you don't want to get the ball back because then you've still if you use your 30, there's still 15 seconds for the other team. So what you want to do is just give the ball up, let them come down, make a stop, and get possession with 10, 15, 20 seconds left. You can call your timeout, get your goalie out. Um, and that's that's how it works. Fifty, They went with about 52 seconds, 51 seconds, which is a bit early, which is probably what led to this, uh, this double two-for-one sequence. And at the other end, the timing wasn't too bad for uh, – for, Colorado at 41 seconds or so with Joey Capito shooting because then they um, Panther City wasn't able to get it and have the have the timeout without having to worry at the end about about giving up a, a possession going the other way on the empty net so uh, yeah but no that's that's the idea is you turn the ball over I don't necessarily love it as a as a strategy I know it's very common a lot of folks use it and there are times it works out great you know, if, you, if they come down and shoot and you get the ball back, you call timeout, it looks really good, right? You get your goalie out, you get your six on five. But so many things can happen. I mean, they can come down and score. They can come down, take a shot and get a rebound, get a fresh 30, and then they get the last possession anyway. It just seems like a lot of things can go awry. I remember playing high school basketball and uh, our coach would say, don't worry if you get your shot blocked. It's okay because three things can happen and two of them are good for us. One is the ball goes back to one of our players, one of your teammates or you. We get possession back. The other is the ball goes out of bounds. We get possession back. The third is the ball goes to the other team. So two-thirds of the results are good for us. And they're more likely if if a guy's going and blocking your shot, it's more likely to go back to the team shooting than the team that's, that's playing defense. Kind of the same thing here. I just think there are more things that can go in favor of the team that that gets the ball after the two for one shot than the team that takes the two for one shot, hoping to get the last possession. But you know, some great lacrosse minds do it regularly. So there's, there's obviously good rationale behind it as well. Yeah. It's just a, uh, you know, it's a, a, supreme confidence in your uh, your defense and your goalie to be able to uh, not only make the save, but then to be able to recover the rebound and make sure that you can get it with the, uh, yeah, yeah, because the rebound is such a big thing, and, and that was, you see so many goals off of the, the turnover. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's such an uncontrollable, the rebound, you know. So, next thing we're going to go to is one highlight clip, and this is one that, uh, the, again, the announcer, and these are, you know, this is um, Brian Shanahan in Toronto doing the color. Shanahan's great. Um, but on this one, I think he kind of misses what happens and it's, it's easy to miss because you got to really watch, watch carefully. And there's a lot going on. Brad Cree picks up this loose ball, um, on the rebound after shot Hayden Dixon is on him. And then it looks like, and, and Shani says, Oh, Cree's trying to avoid the crease, which is absolutely true. But he also is the victim of a great play. And you can see Hayden Dixon getting the chop right on the glove. 
you watch the the last angle i think is gorgeous you see the stick coming down right on Cree's glove that gets the stick moving because you hit the bottom hand it affects the top of the stick and then the little bump in the back certainly nothing heavy enough to be a penalty or a, uh, any kind of violation but it pops the ball right out and it bounces in the crease and that's an easy goal for hayden dixon but it's not without effort it didn't come easily it just turned into an easy goal because of the hard work which is I think a pretty good life plus. Yeah, no, that was a beautiful check. That uh, it, it's so cool when you watch it because you just if you get the uh, the slow mo right, you just you know you watch the hand get hit, the ball pops yeah. out, he's right there. It's like why don't you just do that every time, bud? That's awesome. Because it's really hard. <laughs> That's the thing, right? It's difficult to do. You guys try to do it all the time, but it's to get it right at the right spot at the right time and. And not often does it pop up and bounce in the crease for you. That's for sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's there's issues. I mean, if Cree had been in the crease when he picked that up, you can't touch him. But obviously, he's picking the ball up. You, you know he can't go in the crease, which does limit where he can go. He's not going to turn to his left with the with because he knows there are, there are Calgary players there. He's going to try and circle around behind the behind the net. You pretty much know, and he's got a very slim lane to go. So you know where he's going to be, but still a great play. And uh, Hayden Dixon, he can be a beast. Okay, we're going to look at a couple of goals in the Rochester game. And it's funny, I don't know if you ever go, Greg, on the uh, like online forums uh, for the team. Like I, I, well, I follow a bunch of team fan forums because I'm always curious what everyone's thinking. And boy, fans from most teams think the refs are against them, <laughs> right? It's like they're, <laughs> they're out to get everybody. And uh, which is only natural when you're a big fan of a team. But I think it's it's funny in the, in this one case, the Rochester game, that they uh, have a couple of those. Their, their last goal we're going to see eventually is is waved off. It's a no goal. And there's a big, you know, everyone was questioning, why was that waved off? Even the announcers were having trouble with it because it, it was quite a long time. But we're going to see that. But first, here's the one that none of the Rochester fans are talking about. This is a Ryan Smith goal that ties the game at 12 with six, just over six minutes to play. And Ryan Smith is going to take three shots here. And the first one is stopped by Brett Dobson. Get to rebound. The next one's stopped. Dobson falls back and Smith reaches over and dunks it into the net. They call a goal. There's a review done. Now, I don't know that we got the best angle, so maybe they couldn't confirm it. But watch this. And to me, I don't see how this ball goes in front of the goal line. You watch it and Smith's stick is just ahead of the crossbar, but the crossbar is a good couple feet back from the goal line at this point because Dobson has fallen backwards into the netting and moved the, the net back. Now, when the net moves, if anyone, anyone's not sure of the rule, if the net moves like this, the ball can still go in. If the ball goes in where the net would have been, it's still a goal. You can shoot from the side and it go. It just has to cross where the net would have been, go across the goal line. So you could shoot it in this case, for instance, if you were out to the right here of the crease as we look at it, you could shoot it under his legs up in the air. That's a goal. Even though the net's nowhere near it, it could just go in and doesn't have to get to the match. But the thing is, it has to cross the goal line. So Smith here, the ball would need to be in front of the goal line, not just in front of the, the crossbar. And I don't know, do you, does this look to you like that can possibly be in front of the goal line? I don't, I don't see how it can now that you've explained it like that. Cause I watched it twice thinking, okay. And then I was like, well, they reviewed it. They must've, you know, something, but I wonder if it's one of those that they just didn't feel they had conclusive evidence yeah. because yeah, I'll have to, they may not have had the angle. Like I, we didn't see a lot of angles on the broadcast review. I'm not sure what the, the refs were able to see, but to me, it looked like if you could just and, and maybe he had the, the goal line angle, you know, the camera an angle from the side or something, and it, it made it look like for sure he was he was fine. Or maybe like you said, they just didn't have the conclusive one. To me, I don't see how that ball is in front of the net. It is weird too, because almost every replay they usually give you that overhead. And if, if they mm. would have given us that overhead, you would have been able to see, you know, yeah. clearly if, if you can't see the goal line anymore, then the sticks over the top of it and we know that it went past it but yeah, yeah no as you uh and yeah. so it the thing with the crease but also uh a shot doesn't count unless it goes from in front of goal line or goal line extended essentially right yeah the head of the stick has to be in front of the goal line um or goal line extended it's the whole actually it's the whole goal line it's not it, it's funny we all talk about goal line extended um i don't think you actually have to say extended right because in in box the line goes right across the right across the floor it isn't the goal line extended because in field it's just 
between the pipes and then you're imagining no, the goal line beyond it? I say no? goal line extended because technically if you shot from that rear corner, yeah. if you were behind what would be the goal line, if it theoretically went on forever and wasn't yeah. a line segment, it it's not going to count. But it, oh my God, you're right there. The goal line, okay. So that's right from the corner because I guess the goal line extended. Here we're talking about, you know, you talk about the goal line because it does extend. I'm thinking, sorry. Right. No, it yeah. Extends be- beyond the net yes. to the edges of the crease. Yeah. And in so many cases, that's where the issue is because the guy's shooting um, when the net's off like this, he's shooting from right by the goal line and the head of the stick kind of is over the crease. But yeah, I see. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The goal line, which extended is to the corner would be true as well. Essentially, yeah. because they don't want you what shooting it off the back of the goalie's helmet, right? Yeah, or the back of his, his or just off his Him. back with yeah. no padding. Yeah, because you don't, and and as a goalie, you don't want a bunch of extra padding back there where you're not taking shots because everything's heavy and hot enough anyway, right? <laughs> and you don't want to make goalies wear wear complete body armor all over the back as well. So yeah, it, exactly the the point. You don't want anybody shooting from behind. So this this head of the stick has to be ahead of the goal end as well. Now in this case, because he goes straight over the top. Um, if the ball was in front of the goal line, the head of the stick had to be in front of the goal line because it was in the it was in the stick, right? And it's in right. the mesh, which is over. But but yeah, no, there are lots where it, you can see a guy like bank a shot off the goalie off the back of his leg or something, and it can be tough. It can be tough to determine sometimes, and and that's one that people don't aren't really aware of uh, very often is the the head of the stick above head of the goal. Right. But Rochester fans who were worried about the last one. You don't have to feel badly. For one thing, it's the right call. And for another thing, you may have gotten one there anyway that you maybe shouldn't have had on that that Smith goal there. But this last play is going to be interesting. So Ryan Smith is going to take the ball, drive to the net, and take a shot. It goes wide of the net. Thomas McCombie gets it back. Now, Smith, we're going to go back a little bit and watch that. I just want to see it a couple of times here. Because as Smith runs through the crease and comes out, the official points at him. You can see the hand extended by the ref pointing at Smith. That means they're watching. They started doing that a couple of years ago, actually, when there was a goal that that uh, I think it was Kyle Matisse for Philly scored when he'd gone through the crease. And then like 15 or 20 seconds later was the first guy to take a pass because there just weren't any passes until then. And the goal stood because the ref had lost track of him, but he had nobody else had touched him. It should not have counted. And it was a critical goal in that game. I feel like after that, they really started emphasizing point at the player who's gone through the crease. So the official's pointing at Smith, and Smith actually holds his arms up and says, nope, I'm not eligible, don't pass it to me. McCombie goes and tracks the ball down, but doesn't see that because he's looking the other way, steps up, sees Smith behind the net, still his arms extended. McCombie throws the pass to him, and Smith actually jumps out of the way so that he doesn't play the ball because he knows he's ineligible, and he's hoping it can you know ricochet back and he can get control of the ball again, which they do. It bounces right back out to Thomas McCombie at mid-floor. He whips it down to Smith, who's now come out from behind the crease and around in front, but he's still the first guy to receive a pass. So it's just, it's been a while, and even it goes off screen on the broadcast, so you kind of lose track. But I'm sure the ref is still pointing at Ryan Smith. There is no hesitation. I think it's Ryan Fowler is the uh, the official here. uh, There's no hesitation. Goes in, reviews it, confirms it, because it's in the last two minutes, and says, yep, no goal. And it's absolutely 100% the right call because he was the first to receive it. So any so, of the Rochester fans who are wondering, you didn't get hosed. What if, if they had, if McConvey had shot that and missed the net, yeah. would it still have been the, the same net? call? Yeah. If he had shot yes. it and missed the net because nobody else on the team touched it and he's the next exactly. one, even. Okay. So exactly. it would have had now if it, if it <sighs> grazes uh, one of the uh, Georgia players or obviously grazes the goalie hits the post, anything, then then yeah, it's all it's all good. Things become become live again. But it was a pass directly, and it was it's kind of wild because McCombe grabs it. There's not much time left. He spins and just fires it. I don't even know if he knew he was throwing it to because he's just getting it and firing. And Smith has moved a fair bit since then. He just saw that green jersey and ripped it. And Smith at that point, I think he's thinking, yeah, we'll see. I'll just catch it and see what I can do. You <laughs> know why not? Take it? I think Smith knew he was ineligible. I don't think there was a lot of complaining by Rochester players either after after this one see i thought it was because he stepped back in afterwards but now that you've explained the rule that makes a lot more sense it didn't matter even if he hadn't stepped back in afterwards yeah exactly so yeah so don't feel too bad rochester fans it was the it was the right call the whole way
Next, we're going to go to a few plays. We saw the Trevor Smith earlier, and now we're going to see some plays by Callum Jones. So the Smith and the Joneses really making their marks, making some uncommon plays by players with very common names. And we're going to start with Callum Jones backpedaling after he picks up this loose ball and the rebound, and he uh, he just runs back, gets checked, a little pressure there by Trey LeClaire, and very adroitly avoids the crease as he's backing up and keeps the wherewithal to get a pass ahead and it leads to a goal to by a goal. Jeff Teat as he makes this outlet pass from behind the net, gets it to uh, to Mitch Wilde, I think, who hands it off to Connor Kiernan over to Jeff Teat. So he's not going to get an assist on this play, but for sure he was a key factor in this play. And you know his teammates were well aware of how important he was to that goal. Yeah, because that's I thought at first he was getting the assist too, and then I went back and counted it again. I was like, nope, he was one too many passes away. Yeah, I'm just looking because the assist goes to Kiernan, and actually there should have been another one. I think they'll, that'll be added, actually. We're recording on Monday. I think that one will be added, and I'm pretty sure it was Mitch Wild that he made the first pass to, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Wild should get a uh, should get an assist there, and and well deserved. Jones will not, but he'll get just a just a huge play. I'm just watching it one more time for myself. Yeah, he throws it to uh, to Mitch Wild, who does a nice job of getting himself in an open spot, and then a little fake and runs past Austin Stott's forecheck. Really nice play by Wild and by Kernan and by Cheat. But I still think maybe the best part of this goal is the is the Callum Jones play. And then we're going to go later in the game, and we are going to see Callum Jones being absolutely fierce i love this first play okay so callum jones is checking up on austin stotts you can see him there stotts and stotts runs in he goes into jones tries to set a pick uh, a little seal here he, and jones just backs him up almost straight in to dane doby and then he kind of knocks stotts down i'm not sure if stotts was leaning and jones kind of pulled away and the bat and that threw stotts off balance but stotts falls down comes back sets a pick and then he sees the back of Callum Jones as Jones is covering Dane Doby and decides here's a great chance to get even for this guy knocking me down or letting me drop down. So he gets that, that pick high up on the numbers. Could have been called an illegal pick. Um, maybe should have been, but it wasn't. And it was it's a, it was marginal. It wasn't like it wasn't huge power. He didn't hit him hard. He just kind of got him off balance a bit. But Jones pops up. The ball is actually capped down by a by one of his teammates. And so it's bouncing around. Austin starts, Stotts starts to go for it. And Callum Jones absolutely flattens. Callum Jones flattens Austin Stotts around this play. You see Stotts takes a while to get up. Um, and Callum Jones, he's just a wrecking ball out there. Uh, that is such a fantastic play. Uh, and, you know, you could argue maybe he was getting up around the head. I thought it looked like a pretty clean check, just a hard, solid check. And then we have one more play with just a minute 15 or so to go here. And... They're, New York's pretty fresh off of scoring, and you're going to see Callum Jones is in the middle, pointing, directing traffic, and he's telling Jay Thornbert to go and pick up Curtis Dixon. Good idea. Don't let Dixon go unchecked. Dixon's going to come around the screen. Jones gets on him, knocks him down. Again, it's on his back, but not anything egregious. And then the bump on Austin Stotts, and that allows New York to get the ball back here. They do get the ball to, to Kyle Jackson. He gets a shot because nobody was really picking up uh, Kyle Jackson at that point. So he he was open and, and did get the ball, but the save fairly easy one for Cameron Dunkerley. And he makes the outlet or Jeff Keat picks the ball up in the crease, throws it down. Damon Edwards buries what turns into the insurance marker for New York. And uh, just terrific play by Jones and getting after Dixon. I like when he goes after him on the floor that he's still engaging, still checking, but not so much to get, take a penalty. Because when somebody's laying on the floor, if you slash them, if you cross-check them, it's a penalty. That's just the way it works, right? And you can't do it when on, on the floor. But you can go after the stick. You can engage to a certain extent, and he manages that, which is so challenging when you're such a physical and aggressive player like Jones is to contain yourself in this high-intensity, high-value moment in the game. I just think that's fantastic lacrosse. Yeah, no, I uh, I think New York's defense is a big part of the reason. I don't think anybody was expecting Callum Jones to be quite this good coming out, you know, this early. I mean, I, I'm sure there's guys that, that thought so, but for me, yeah. I just, I, 
I was just so impressed with their defense. That's the main reason I picked yeah. them because I figured once Dunkerley started making all those saves that he's supposed to make, and then you get the two or three, you know, amazing saves that you're like, wow, how did he come up with that? That yeah. that was really the whole reason I picked them. You know, just that yeah. whole uh, offense wins games, but defense wins championships. Yeah, and I, I mean, I was pretty high on Callum Jones four four years ago before he went down to I think it was Norwich. He went to school down in uh, in New York and uh, to a military academy and did because he'd finished junior lacrosse and then went to school for hockey um, and also wound up playing some lacrosse down there as well. But uh, he uh, he would have been a, a top three or five pick if he'd come out four years ago. Uh, so I when he was coming out, I was like, yeah. And, and watching him play last year with Oakville, um, he was great at the President's Cup before he had a minor injury. I figured he's ready to come and play. And he's, you know, 24, 25 years old, having done the, the late college career. I figured he's going to come out and make an impact. Maybe not quite as much as he had. I mean, well, you could you could argue he's he's their best defender. I'd I'd go. You know, there's some other guys who are playing very well for them, but uh, yeah, he's he's been huge. Yeah, see, that's just me not knowing that he, because I understand I. I was a big hockey guy. So I, like there were so many 21 year old freshmen going into play college that. Yeah. So after you said yeah. that, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense, but that's me yeah. not following juniors and not following anything up in the summer in Canada, hardly other than the championship. I didn't know yeah. much about this guy, but then it didn't take very long of watching their uh, New York games to be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. worth all of it. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I, I watched him in junior, but I first really noticed Callum Jones when he was playing in the arena lacrosse league back when he was 17, or 18 playing for the Paris River Wolves and he just jumped off the floor for you You could see him I'm calling games I'm like holy cow who is this kid and in both a good way and a not as good way where he would make some great plays and he would also run around doing crazy stuff and you'd be like what are you doing like running around looking for the hit just run just running everywhere when there are times it's like dude just stand there for a second because you know, like, you're in position if you keep moving you're out of position but and he would just but he was just trying so hard he, but he's so he was so physical and so skilled and uh, such a tough player even then and then he harnessed all that became a junior ontario junior lacrosse league uh, defender of the year with burlington and i was like wow this kid's really something special and he's gonna he's gonna have a big impact and then just when i thought he's coming out he, he let me know he's you know he's going down to north to play hockey uh, or he was thinking about it and he wound up going down um and so i didn't get to see him play he didn't play a lot of box across for a few years he didn't get to see much of him he came back and played he was uh, playing with oakville and senior b as we mentioned he played some msl and then they took a hiatus so he played senior b and uh, i thought he looked really good again and i talked to his coach in in college and said hey you know his big thing here was before was managing that boundary managing the physical aggressive getting your face be the disruptor guy with not going over the line, not running yourself out of position, not taking too many penalties. And he said, yeah, he went through the same thing in college lacrosse when he played, but he figured it out and he was a dominant player for them by the end. And I thought, yeah, you know, he's, he's ready. And then you see it, you saw it when I saw him in Oakville last year. Uh, I just thought, yeah, he's, he's got a handle on it. And you can see that like that to me, the, the play with, with Dixon on the ground, I think is a great example where it's so easy to take a penalty there. Now, are they going to call a penalty in the last minute of the game? It seems less likely. The whistles do tend to get put away a bit, but uh, you never know. I, th I think I think you should call the, the rules the way they're called throughout the game. If a guy slashes somebody on the ground in the last minute of play, call it a penalty, you know? But uh, at the same time, there are times I'm going to say, oh, you can't call that late in the game if it's something else. That, so it, it's very much a, an uncertain thing, which is why you've got to be careful. But I, I just think he's he's a tremendous defender. Um, uh, and just so tough and, and, you know, good teammate. I think there's just a lot going on for him and for that New York defense and the whole New York team. Yeah, absolutely. A huge fan. Now, another, yeah. uh, I've got a question for you kind of on the, the, sure. the referee calls and I'm probably going to clip this yeah. over the top. Cause I got it. What'd you think of Kel's, yeah. uh, Tyson bell, no call the moving pick on Kel's diving out at Tyson. Uh, the no call. Well, they called him for a moving pick. Well, they called for a moving yeah. pick, but I mean, yeah. there was no, uh, Bell obviously wanted a penalty called, but just the fact yeah, that, so right. And then Weathers and then boom, I just, I, yeah. I love the fact that Kells gets out there. He is involved in everything. Yeah. Sometimes you got to yeah. wonder like, what are you doing? You're like against Albany at the beginning of the year, he loses his mind, takes a penalty and you're like, what are you doing? Yeah. But there's a very yeah. fine line between being able to fire your team up and then they come down and score the next goal. 
in yeah. doing something stupid. I, I was impressed with it. I, I loved it. What goalie, when you think of the pick behind the net and the big, big bump, what goalie do you think of immediately? Come on behind the net like that? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'd have to say Vince. Yep. Matt Vince does it all the time, throws the big body checks, and he'll get called for it sometimes, won't get called for it sometimes. That's a pretty good role model to emulate. And, of course, Vince and Kells are both goalies for the Peterborough Lakers in major series of lacrosse. Now, Vince hasn't played um, for a bit. I'm not sure he's going to play MSL anymore. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's been playing for a while. I think summer's maybe a time off for him. I don't know. They've got, But they're in pretty good hands because the, the Lakers had – Vince and Poulin, Mike Poulin is their goalies. Um, so when they went out west a few years ago for the Man Cup and Matt Vince couldn't go, because that's the beginning of the school year, and it's really hard for teachers to get time off at the beginning of the school year when there's times throughout the year they've needed things for their lacrosse careers, right? So Vince couldn't go, and he was also, they just had a baby, he and his wife. So uh, Poulin was the guy, and Peter was fine, and Poulin may have been the MVP of the series, I can't remember. Uh, they won the Man Cup with Mike Poulin, they were, they were just fine. But they had a very young backup at that point. But then now neither Vince nor Poulin is really playing summer lately. So Kells stepped up last year. They've also, I mean, they've got Drew Hutchison. They've got um, uh, Doug Bucken, who's played very well for them over the last few years. So they've got a lot of goaltending. But Kells, Kells is the guy. And you can, you can see a, the Vince inspiredness in it. Now yeah. that you say, as soon as you pointed that out, I was yeah. like, I don't know how I didn't see that before. Yeah. Because he definitely plays with that edge it was like two weeks ago i clipped a highlight somebody going towards the crease and vince doesn't even think about making the save he just tackles the guy <laughs> right. coming in, he yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah and it's terrifying with that vince coming at you because you know all the players have seen him without his gear on with in just a warm-up shirt he is a, a beast an absolute hulk of a man i still love the the fact that years ago when vince and aaron bold were the two goalies for the rochester nighthawks um i was talking to some coaches or that from the team and they said yeah so we did our our fitness testing at the start of camp every year we do our our fitness testing of all the players and the top two guys on their rankings of the, the fittest guys were matt vince and aaron bold in some order i'm not sure who was first and who was second and that may still be the case to this day for those two because they're both i mean vince is a is a high school teacher but he's he's so fit so in shape and so committed to it and aaron bold's a personal trainer and he's also he's just a beast i mean and that is Part of why they're still playing in the NLL later in their careers and still able to, to handle the grind of grind of it. No, that makes so much sense. I mean, you look at, yeah. at any any athlete who's taken it far into their career, it's always somebody who takes their body very serious. You're in incredible physical shape. You you always hear about guys talking about their crazy diets and their crazy just mm-hmm. everything. They're so strict. Everything's and it yeah. shows. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Uh, I I'm a huge Matt Vince fan. I love watching him play. As far as he's he's a goalie who can take over a game. You know, either yeah. emotionally going out and setting that pick for you to get you the last possession, or to help secure the next thirty seconds for your team, or yeah. making a big save. Like you never know what he's going to do. I yeah, he uh, yeah. I I'm a huge fan of watching him. That's a really hot take there. Matt Vince is good. <laughs> All right, now something a little less common than Matt Vince is good. Let's talk about your jersey. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this, I'm going to tilt down a little bit. This is an absolute beauty. I love the minimalism. This is a hungry jersey, number 28, thanks to George Hanzi for it. And uh, it's the stag, which is a national symbol, the outline. I just think it's a fantastic jersey. I love the colors. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of this. And Hungary, who is coming to the World Championships in Utica this September, and they're going to have some players. They've got Alec Camus is uh, really good. He's played very well for them. He's a guy who played junior A and coaches. And he played in the, in the arena league. He's a very good D tranny player. Um, also, speaking of very good D tranny, or maybe more of a forward for Hungary, uh, one guy that I've heard very likely to be playing for Hungary is Kyle Matisse. Yeah, I would imagine he's definitely playing offense if he's playing for Hungary. I, I've, I've... Well, he might just play both ways. I mean, that's the thing, right? When he played for Philly, when they, remember when they started keeping track of time on floor and uh, and he was playing like 32, 33 minutes a game, which is insane because he'd play a D shift, then go up and play O and then go back and play D. And it's like, holy cow, and do that throughout a game. And he's not. You see it more in this sport than almost any sport, maybe other than baseball with hitting the ball, but where you mm-hmm. can really make up for uh, athletic deficiencies. Like we joke, you know, about Banesh. Yeah, I don't really sprint off the floor afterwards. Yeah. But then when you watch like all the assists he has and then every game, he does some amazing things that you're like, you know, could he get away with this? But it's just because he's so smart and he knows what's going to happen. And the loose balls he gets. Yeah, it's crazy. 
He, how do you, how do, how is he always there? I, I remember watching like Zach Courier at one point, and he's got no athletic deficiencies, but watching because he was getting record loose ball numbers and thinking, why does the ball always just wind up near him? And then you have to watch the game in kind of a completely different way to see how he's thinking ahead that he just, it doesn't just happen to be near him. He's taking angles. He's doing things to get him there. Ryan Vanessa is the same thing. He's, he's, he's seeing when somebody's shooting, where they're shooting from, where the goalie is, how the ball is likely to come out and he's getting to that spot. And that, even if you know to do that, it can be challenging to do it effectively because you've got to almost need an advanced degree in physics to, uh, to figure that some of this stuff out or geometry and physics. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's, it's the old Wayne Gretzky thing, right? His dad always taught him go where the puck's going, not where it is. It's simple. Yeah, makes then sense. Try and do it. <laughs> then try and do it better than everybody else in the world. Yeah, yeah. No, it uh, it makes perfect sense. But like you said, it's that I really believe in that ten thousand hour rule. You know, just being in that position so many times, knowing the physics of it, but then knowing, okay, well, sometimes it hits this, or sometimes it hits that, and yeah. just yeah, the little things. It is always awesome. But uh, of course, yeah, we went on for like another fifteen minutes off of all that. But <laughs> as always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to run, unfortunately, but it's it's been awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing the knowledge and helping grow. And I love the uh, the segments we're doing with little shots from from the outside as far as what's going on with the world games, kind of keeping us up to date as we head into uh, this fall, you know, world season. So thanks. I uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, I love it. And there's going to be lots more of that coming as things build towards. It's always fun to get together and talk about the game. And, and I hope, hope we help some people just either just enjoy